Hello, this paper is On Sense and Reference by Gottlob Frege. It was originally published in 1892 as Übersinn und Bedeutung in Zeitschrift für Philosophy and Philosophische Kritik, volume 100, pages 25 to 50. This is a translation by Max Black, published in 1948 in The Philosophical Review, volume 57, number 3, pages 209 to 230. Firstly, here is the introductory note to the paper, written by Max Black. A translation of Frege's Übersinn und Bedeutung. Introductory note. The logical and mathematical writings of Gottlob Frege are gradually emerging from undeserved neglect. After a lapse of half a century, it is becoming generally recognised that his views on topics of fundamental importance in the foundations of mathematics and the philosophy of symbolism deserve very serious attention. And many feel that where Frege's judgment differs from the more generally received doctrine, he is more likely to be right than his opponents. This process of re-evaluation would be hastened if Frege's writings were more generally accessible. It has therefore seemed worthwhile to translate his famous paper on Sinn und Bedeutung, published in 1892 in the Zeitschrift für Philosophie und Philosophische Kritik, volume 100, pages 25 to 50. The point of central interest is Frege's distinction between sense, Sinn, and designation or denotation, or as I have chosen to call it, reference, bedeutung. This, this corresponds, in some measure, to a distinction which other philosophers have made between connotation and denotation, or intention and extension, or even description and acquaintance. But Frege's distinction is not to be identified with any of these. I doubt that many philosophers would accept Frege's demonstration that the referent of a declarative sentence is either the true or the false or that many will sympathise with his dogged persistence in examining the relevance of his distinction to the manifold types of subordinate clauses, which may be exemplified in complex sentences. But if his doctrines occasionally seem implausible, they always deserve detailed refutation, and the effort of following his argument is rewarded by flashes of penetrating insight. In trying to prepare a literal translation which will not sound foreign, one runs into obvious difficulties. In the present instance, these are aggravated by the novelty of Frege's ideas and the consequent lack of a settled terminology mm. for their expression. Thus, some might, may object to my choice of refer to for bedeuten and referent for bedeutung, but denote is misleading, designatum clumsy, and nominatum, Carnap's suggestion, too new for general acceptance. The translator is also harassed by Frege's fondness for parenthetical qualifications and his liberal use of untranslatable German particles. I have tried to be faithful to Frege's intentions, even at the cost of occasional clumsiness. The following is a list of the chief terms used by Frege in technical senses, often diverging from the common meanings of the words, together with the English equivalents chosen. And this is available on screen now. The footnotes are Frege's own, except for five interpolated comments, shown by the use of small capital letters as markers. Uh, to clarify, I won't be reading these, but I will be reading the footnotes. Marginal numbers indicate the original pagination. Cornell University, Max Black. And now we turn to the essay itself. Sense and Reference by Gottlob Frege. Identity, footnote. I use this word strictly and understand A equals B to have the sense of A is the same as B, or A and B coincide. It gives rise to challenging questions which are not altogether easy to answer. Is it a relation? A relation between objects or between names or signs of objects. In my begriff shift, I assumed the latter. The reasons which seem to favour this are the following. A equals A and A equals B are obviously statements of differing cognitive value. A equals A holds a priori, and according to Kant, is to be labelled analytic, while statements of the form A equals B often contain very valuable extensions of our knowledge and cannot always be established a priori. The discovery that the rising sun is not new every morning, but always the same, was a very great consequence to astronomy. Even today, the identification of a small planet or a comet is not always a matter of course. Now, if you were to regard identity as a relation between that which the names A and B designate, it would seem that A equals B could not differ from A equals A, i.e. provided A equals B is true. A relation would thereby be expressed of a thing to itself, and indeed one in which each thing stands to itself, but to no other. What is intended to be said by A equals B seems to be that the signs or names A and B designate the same thing, 
that those signs themselves would be under discussion. A relation between them would be asserted. But this relation would hold between the names or signs only insofar as they named or designated something. It would be mediated by the connection of each of the two signs with the same designated thing. But this is arbitrary. Nobody can be forbidden to use any arbitrarily producible event or object as a sign for something. In that case, the sentence A equals B would no longer refer to the subject matter, but only to its mode of designation. We would express no proper knowledge by its means. But in many cases, this is just what we want to do. If the sign A is distinguished from the sign B only as object, here by means of its shape, not as sign, i.e. not by the manner in which it designates something, the cognitive value of A equals A becomes essentially equal to that of A equals B, provided A equals B is true. A difference can arise only if the difference between the signs corresponds to a difference in the mode of presentation of that which is designated. Let A, B, C be the lines connecting the vertices of a triangle with the midpoints of the opposite sides. The point of intersection of A and B is then the same as the point of intersection of B and C. So we have dis different designations of the same point, and these names, point of intersection of A and B, point of intersection of B and C, likewise indicate the mode of presentation, and hence the statement contains true knowledge. It is natural now to think of their being connected with the sign name combination of words letter besides that to which the sign refers, which may be called the referent of the sign, also what I would like to call the sense of the sign, wherein the mode of presentation is concerned. In our example, accordingly, the reference of the expressions the point of intersection of A and B and the point of intersection of B and C would be the same, though not their senses. A referent of evening star would be the same as that of morning star, but not the same. It is clear from the context that by sign and name I have here understood any designation representing a proper name, whose referent is thus a definite object, this word taken in the widest range, but no concept and no relation which shall be discussed further in another article. The designation of a single object can also consist of several words or other signs. For brevity, let every such designation be called a proper name. The sense of a proper name is grasped by everybody who is sufficiently familiar with the language or totality of designations to which it belongs. Footnote. In the case of an actual proper name, such as Aristotle, opinions as to the sense may differ. It might, for instance, be taken to be the following. The pupil of Tr Plato and teacher of Alexander the Great. Anybody who does this will attach another sense to the sentence. Aristotle was born in Stagira, then will a man who takes the sense of the name, the teacher of Alexander the Great, who was born in Stagira. So long as the referent remains the same, such variations of sense may be tolerated, although they are to be avoided in the theoretical structure of a demonstrative science and ought not to occur in a complete language. But this serves to illuminate only a single aspect of the referent, supposing it to exist. Comprehensive knowledge of the referent would require us to be able to say immediately whether every given sense belongs to it. It is clear from the context that by sign and name, I have here understood any designation representing a proper name, whose referent is thus a definite object, this word taken in the widest range, but no concept and no relation, which shall be discussed further in another article. The designation of a single object can also consist of several words or other signs. For brevity, let every such designation be called a proper name. The sense of a proper name is grasped by everybody who is sufficiently familiar with the language or totality of designations to which it belongs. Footnote. In the case of an actual proper name such as Aristotle, opinions as to the sense may differ. It might, for instance, be taken to be the following, the pupil of Plato and teacher of Alexander the Great. Anybody who does this will attach another sense to the sentence. Aristotle was born in Sekira. Then will a man who takes it as the sense of the name the teacher of Arist Alexander the Great, who was born in Stagira. So long as the referent remains the same, such variations of sense may be tolerated, although they are to be avoided in the theoretical structure of a demonstrative science and ought not to appear in a complete language. But this serves to illuminate only a simple aspect of the referent, supposing it to exist. Comprehensive knowledge of the referent would require us to be able to say immediately whether every given sense belongs to it. To such knowledge we never attain.
If words are used in the ordinary way, one intends to speak of their reference. It could also happen, however, that one wishes to talk about the words themselves or their sense. This happens, for instance, when the words of another are quoted. One's own words then first designate words of the other speaker, and only the latter have their usual reference. We then have signs of signs. In writing, the words are in this case enclosed in quotation marks. Accordingly, a word standing between quotation marks must not be taken as having its ordinary referent. In order to speak of the sense of an expression A, one must simply use its phrase, the sense of the expression A. In reported speech, one talks about the sense, e.g. of another person's remarks. It is quite clear that in this way of speaking, words do not have their customary reference, but designate what is usually their sense. In order to have a short expression, we will say, in reported speech, words are used indirectly or have their indirect reference. We distinguish accordingly the customary from the indirect referent of a word, and its customary sense from its indirect sense. The indirect referent of a word is accordingly its customary sense. Such exceptions must always be borne in mind if the mode of connection between sign, sense and referent in particular cases is to be correctly understood. The referent and sense of a sign are to be distinguished from the associated conception. If the referent of a sign is an object perceivable within the senses, my conception of it is an internal image. Footnote. We can include with the conceptions the direct experiences in which sense impressions and activities themselves take the place of the traces which they have left in the mind. The distinction is unimportant for our purpose, especially since memories of sense impressions and activities always help to complete the conceptual image. One can also understand direct experience as including any object, insofar it is, as it is sensibly perceptible or spatial. Arising from memories of sense impressions which I have had and activities, both internal and external, which I have performed. Such a conception is often saturated with feeling. The clarity of its separate parts varies in us. The same sense is not always connected, even in the same man, with the same conception. The conception is subjective. One man's conception is not that of another. There result, as a matter of course, a variety of differences in the conceptions associated with the same sense. A painter, a horseman and a zoologist will probably connect different conceptions with the name Lucifalus. This constitutes an essential distinction between the conception and the sign's sense, which may be the common property of many and is therefore not a part or a mode of the individual mind. For one can hardly deny that mankind has a common store of thoughts, which is transmitted from one generation to another. Footnote. Hence it is inadvisable to use the word conception to designate something so basically different. In the light of this, one need have no scruples in speaking simply of the sense, whereas in the case of a conception, one must precisely indicate to whom it belongs and at what time. It might perhaps be said, just as one man connects this conception and another that conception with the same word, so also one man can associate this sense and another that sense. But there still remains a difference in the mode of connection. They are not prevented from grasping the same sense, but they cannot have the same conception. See duo idem facient non est idem. If the two persons conceive the same, each still has his own conception. It is indeed sometimes possible to establish differences in the conceptions, or even in the sensations, of different men, but an exact comparison is not possible, because we cannot have both conceptions con together in the same consciousness. The referent of a proper name is the object itself, which we designate by its means. The conception, which we thereby have, is fully subjective. In between lies the sense, which is indeed no longer subjective like the conception, but is yet not the top object itself. The following analogy will perhaps clarify these relationships. Somebody observes the moon for a telescope. I compare the moon itself to the referent. It is the object of the observation, mediated by the real image projected by the object glass of the interior of the telescope, and by the retinal image of the observer. The former I compare to the sense, the latter the conception or experience. The optical image in the telescope is indeed one-sided and dependent upon the standpoint of observation, but it is still subjective, objective, sorry, inasmuch as it can be used by several observers. At any rate, it could be arranged for several to use it simultaneously, but each one would have his own retinal image. 
On account of the diverse shape of the observer's eyes, either a geometrical congruence could hardly be achieved, and a true coincidence would be out of the question. This analogy might be developed still further by assuming A's retinal image made visible to B, or A might also see his own retinal image in a mirror. In this way, we might perhaps show how a conception can itself be taken as an object, but as such is not to the observer what is directly to the person having the conception. But to pursue this would take us too far afield. We can now recognise three levels of difference between words, expressions or whole sentences. The difference may concern at most the conceptions, or the sense but not the referent, or finally the referent as well. With respect to the first level, it is to be noted that, on account of the uncertain connection of conceptions with words, a difference may ha hold for one person, which another does not find. The difference between a translation and the original text should probably not overstep the first level. To the possible differences here belong also the colouring and shading which poetic eloquence seeks to give to the sense. Such colouring and shading are not objective, and must be evoked by each hearer or reader accordingly, according to the hints of the poet or the speaker. Without some affinity in human conceptions, art would certainly be impossible, but it can never be exactly determined how far the intentions of the poet are realised. In what follows there will be no further discussion of conceptions and experiences, they have been mentioned here only to ensure that, that the conception aroused in the, in the hearer by a word shall not be confused with its sense or its referent. To make short and exact expressions possible, let the following phraseology be established. A proper name, word, sign, sign combination, expression, expresses its sense, refers to or designates its referent. By means of a sign, we express its sense and designate its referent. Idealists or sceptics will perhaps long since have objected. You talk, without further ado, of the moon as an object, but how do you know that the name, the moon, has any referent? How do you know that anything whatsoever has a referent? I reply that when we say the moon, we do not intend to speak of our conception of the moon, nor are we satisfied with the sense alone, but we presuppose a referent. To assume that in the sentence, the moon is smaller than the earth, the conception of the moon is in question, would be flatly to misunderstand the sense. If this is what the speaker wanted, he would use the phrase, my conception of the moon. Now we can, of course, be mistaken in the presupposition, and such mistakes have indeed occurred. But the question whether the presupposition is perhaps always mistaken need not be answered here. In order to justify mention of the referent of a sign, it is enough at first to point out our intention in speaking or thinking. We must then add the reservation, provided such a referent exists. So far, we have considered the sense and reference only of such expressions, words or signs as we have called proper names. We now inquire concerning the sense and referent of an entire declarative sentence. Such a sentence contains a thought. Footnote. By a thought I understand not the subjective performance of thinking, but its objective content, which is capable of being the common property of several thinkers. Is this thought now to be regarded as its sense or its referent? Let us assume for the time being that the sentence has a referent. If we now replace one word of the sentence by ha another having the same referent, but a sent different sense, this can have no influence upon the referent of the sentence. Yet we can see that in such a case the thought changes, since, e.g., the thought of the sentence, the morning star is a body illuminated by the sun, differs from that of the sentence, the evening star is a body illuminated from the sun, by the sun, sorry. Anybody who did not know that the evening star is the morning star might hold the one thought to be true and the other false. The thought accordingly cannot be the referent of the sentence, but rather must be considered as the sense. What is the position now with regard to the referent? Have we a right even to inquire about it? Is it possible that a sentence as a whole has only a sense but no referent? At any rate, one might expect that such sentences occur just as there are parts of sentences having sense but no referent. And sentences which contain proper names without reference will be of this kind. The sentence, Odysseus was set ashore at Thaka, while sound asleep, obviously has a sense. But since it, is, since it is doubtful whether the name Odysseus occurring therein has a referent, it is also doubtful whether the whole sentence has one. Yet it is certain, nevertheless, that anybody who took seriously the sentence to be true or false would ascribe the name Odysseus a referent not merely a sense, 
for it is the referent of the name which is held to be or not to be characterised by the predicate. Whoever does not consider the referent to exist can neither apply nor withhold the predicate, but in that case it would be superfluous to advance to the referent of the name. One could be satisfied with the sense if one wanted to go no further than the thought. If it were a question only of the sense of the referent, sense of the sentence, the thought, it would be unnecessary to bother with referent of a part of the sentence. Only the sense, not the referent, of the part is relevant to the whole sense of the whole sentence. The thought remains the same whether Odysseus has a referent or not. The fact that we concern ourselves at all about the referent of a part of the sentence indicates that we generally recognise and expect a referent for the sentence itself. The thought loses value for us as soon as we recognise that the referent of one of its parts is missing. We are therefore justified in not being satisfied with the sense of a sentence and inquiring also as to its referent. And now why do we want every proper name to have not only a sense but also a referent? Why is a thought not enough for us? Because, and to the extent that we are concerned with its truth value. This is not always the case. In hearing an epic poem, for instance, apart from the euphony of the language we are interested only in the sense of the sentences and the images and feelings thereby aroused. The question of truth would cause us to abandon aesthetic delight for an attitude of scientific investigation. Hence, it is a matter of indifference to us whether the name Odysseus, for instance, has a referent, so long as we accept the poem as a work of art. Footnote. It would be desirable to have a special term for signs having only sense. If we name them, say, representations, the word of the actors on stage would be representations. Indeed, the actor himself would be a representation. It is the striving for truth that drives us always to advance from the sense to the referent. We have seen that the referent of a sentence may always be sought, whenever the referents of its components are involved, and that this is the case when and only when we are inquiring after the truth value. We are therefore driven into accepting the truth value of a sentence as its referent. By the truth value of a sentence, I understand the circumstance that it is true or false. There are no further truth values. For brevity, I call the one the true, the other the false. Every declarative sentence concerned with the reference of its words is therefore to be regarded as a proper name, and its referent, if it exists, is either the true or the false. These two objects are recognised, if only implicitly, by everybody who judges something to be true, and so even by a sceptic. The designation of the truth value of its objects may appear to be an arbitrary fancy or perhaps a mere play upon words, from which no pr profound consequences could be drawn. What I mean by an object can be more exactly discussed only in connection with concept and relation. I will preserve this for another article. But so much should already be clear that in every judgment, footnote, a judgment for me is not the mere comprehension of a thought, but the recognition of its truth. No matter how trivial, the step from the level of the thoughts to the level of reference, the objective, has already been taken. One might be tempted to regard the relation of the thought to the true not as that of the sense of reference, but rather as that of a subject to predicate. One can indeed say the thought that five is a prime number is true, but closer examination shows that nothing more than has been said than in the simple sentence five is a prime number. The truth claim arises in each case from the form of the declarative sentence, and when the latter lacks its usual force, e.g. in the mouth of an actor upon the stage, even the sentence, the thought that five is a prime number is true, contains only a thought, and indeed the same thought as the simple five is a prime number. It follows that the relation of the thought to the true may not be compared with that of subject to predicate. Subject and predicate, understood in the logical sense, are indeed elements of thought. They stand on the same level for knowledge. By combining subject and predicate, one reaches only a thought, never passes from a sense to its referent, never from a thought to its truth value. One moves at the same level, but never advances from one level to the next. A truth value cannot be a part of a thought, any more than the sun can, for it is not a sense, but an object. If our supposition that the referent of a sentence is its truth value is correct, the letter must remain unchanged when a part of the sentence is replaced by an expression having the same referent. And this is in fact the case. Leibniz explains, Iodem sunt que sibi mutuo substituti possunt salva veritate. What else is but the truth value could be found, that belong quite generally to every sentence concerned with the reference of its components and remains unchanged by substitutions of the kind in question. If now the truth value of a sentence is its referent, then on the other hand all true sentences have the same referent and so, 
on the other hand, do all full sentences. From this, we see that in the referent of the sentence, all that is specific is obliterated. We can never be concerned only with the referent of a sentence, but again, the mere thought alone yields no knowledge, but only the thought together with its referent, i.e. its truth value. Judgments can be regarded as advances from a thought to a truth value. Naturally, this cannot be a definition. Judgment is something quite peculiar and incomparable. One might also say that judgments are dis distinctions of parts within truth values. Such distinction occurs by a return to the thought. To every sense belonging to a truth value, there would correspond its own manner of analysis. However, I have here used the word part in a speci special sense. I have in fact transferred the relation between the parts and the whole of the sentence to its referent by calling the referent of a word part of the referent of a sentence. If the word itself is a part of the sentence, this way of speaking can certainly be attacked because in the case of a referent, the whole and one part do not suffice to determine the remainder. And because the word part is already used in another sense of bodies, a special term would need to be invented. The supposition that the truth value of a sentence is its referent shall now be put to further test. We have found that the truth value of a sentence remains unchanged when an expression is replaced by another having the same referent. But we have not yet considered the case in which the expression to be replaced is itself a sentence. Now, if our view is correct, the truth value of a sentence containing another as part must remain unchanged when the part is replaced by another sentence having the same truth value. Exemptions are to be expected when the whole sentence or its part is direct or in direct quotation, for in such cases, as we have seen, the words do not have their customary reference. In direct quotation, a sentence designates another sentence, and in indirect quotation, a thought. We are thus led to consider subordinate sentences or clauses. These occur as parts of a sentence structure, which is, from a logical standpoint, likewise a sentence. But here we meet the question whether it is also true of the subordinate sentence that its referent is a truth value. Of indirect quotation, we already know the opposite. Grammarians view subordinate clauses as representatives of parts of sentences and divide them accordingly into noun classes, adjective classes, adverbial clauses. This might generate the supposition that the referent of a subordinate clause was not a truth value, but rather of the same kind as a referent of a noun or adjective or adverb, in short, of a part of a sentence whose sense was not a thought, but only a part of a thought. Only a more thorough investigation can clarify the issue. In so doing, we shall not follow the grammatical category strictly, but rather group together what is logically of the same kind. Let us first search for cases in which the sense of the subordinate clause, as we have just supposed, is not an independent thought. The case of an abstract noun clause, introduced by that, includes the case of indirect quotation, in which we have seen the words to have their indirect reference coinciding with what is customarily their sense. In this case, then, the subordinate clause has for its reference a thought, not a truth value, a sense not a thought, but the sense of the words thought that, which is only a part of the thought of the entire complex sentence. This happens after say, hear, be of the opinion, be convinced, conclude, and similar words. Footnote. In a lied in saying that he had seen B. The subordinate clause designates a thought which is said, one, to be asserted by A, two, while A was convinced of its falsity. Otherwise, and indeed somewhat complicated, is the situation after words like perceive, know, fancy, which are to be considered later. That in the cases of the first kind, the referent of the subordinate clause is in fact a thought, can also be recognised by seeing that it is indifferent to the truth of the whole, whether the subordinate clause is true or false. Let us compare, for instance, the two sentences, Copernicus believed that the planetary orbits are circles, and Copernicus believed that the apparent motion of the sun is produced by a real motion of the earth. One subordinate clause can be substituted for the other without harm to the truth. The main clause and the subordinate clause together have as their sense only a single thought, and the truth of the whole includes neither the truth nor the untruth of the subordinate clause. In such cases, it is not permissible to replace one expression in the subordinate clause by another having the same customary referent, but only by one having the same indirect referent, i.e. the same customary sense. If somebody were to conclude the referent of a sentence is not its truth value, for then it could always be replaced by another sentence of the same truth value, he would prove too much. One might just as well claim that the referent of morning star is not Venus, since one may always say Venus in place of morning star. 
one has the right to conclude only that the referent of a sentence is not always its truth value, and that morning star does not always refer to the planet of Venus, namely when the word has its indirect referent. An exception of such a kind occurs in the subordinate clause just considered, whose reference are thoughts. If one says, it seems that, one means, it seems to me that, or I think that. We therefore have the same case again. The situation is similar in the case of expressions such as to be pleased, to regret, to approve, to blame, to hope, to fear. If, toward the end of the Battle of Waterloo, Wellington was glad that the Prussians were coming, the basis of his joy was a conviction. Had he been deceived, he would have been no less pleased so long as his illusion lasted, and just before he became so convinced, he could not have been pleased that the Prussians were coming, even though, in fact, they might have been already approaching. Just as a conviction or belief is the ground of a feeling, it can, as an inference, also be the ground of a conviction. In the sentence, Columbus inferred from the roundness of the earth that he could reach India by travelling towards the west. We have as reference to the parts two thoughts, that the earth is round and that Columbus, by travelling to the west, could reach India. All that is relevant here is that Columbus was convinced of both, and that the one conviction was a ground for the other. Whether the earth is really round, and whether Columbus could really reach India by travelling to the west, are immaterial to the truth of our sentence. But it is not immaterial whether we replace the earth by the planet which is accompanied by a moon whose diameter is greater than the fourth part of its own. Here, we, here also we have the indirect reference of the word. Adverbial clauses of purpose beginning with in order to also belong here. But obviously the purpose is a thought, therefore indirect reference for the word's subjunctive mood. A subordinate clause with that after command, ask, forbid, would appear in direct speech as an imperative. Such a clause has no referent but only a sense. A command, a request, are indeed not thoughts, yet they stand on the same level as thoughts. Hence, in subordinate clauses, depending on command, ask, etc., words have their indirect reference. The referent of such a clause is therefore not a truth value, but a command, a request, and so forth. The case is similar for the dependent question in phrases such as doubt whether, not to know that, not to know what. It is easy to see that here also the words are to be taken to have their indirect reference. Dependent clauses expressed in questions and beginning with who, what, where, when, how, by what means, etc. seem at times to approximate very closely to the observial, adverbial clauses in which words have their customary reference. These cases are distinguished linguistically by the mood of the verb. In the case of the subjunctive, we have a dependent question and indirect reference of the words, so that a proper name cannot, in general, be replaced by another name with the same object. In the cases so far considered, the words of the subordinate clauses had their indirect reference, and this made it clear that the referent of the subordinate clause itself was indirect, i.e. not a truth value but a thought, a command, a request, a question. The subordinate clause could be regarded as a noun, indeed one could say as a proper name of that thought, that command, etc., which it represented in the context of the sentence structure. We now come to other subordinate clauses in which the words do have their customary reference without having, however, a thought occurring, a sense, and a truth value as referent. How this is possible is best made clear by examples. He who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits died in misery. If the sense of the subordinate clause here was a thought, it would have to be possible to express it in also in a separate sentence. But this does not work, because the grammatical subject he has no independent sense and only mediates the relations with the consequent clause died in misery. For this, the reason the sense of the subordinate clause is not a complete thought, and its referent is Kepler, not a truth value. One might object that the sense of whole does not does contain a thought as part, namely, that there was somebody who first discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits, but whoever takes the whole to be true cannot deny this part. This is undoubtedly so, but only because the otherwise a subordinate clause, he who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits, would have no referent. If anything is asserted, there is always an obvious presupposition that the simple or compound proper names used have reference. If one therefore asserts Kepler died in misery, there is a presupposition that the name Kepler designates something. But it does not follow that the sense of the sentence, Kepler died in misery, contains the thought that the name Kepler designates something. If this were the case, indication would have to run not. Kepler did not die in misery, but Kepler did not die in misery, or the name Kepler has no referent. 
that the name Kepler designates something is just as much a presupposition for the assertion Kepler died in misery as for the contrary assertion. Now languages have the fault of containing expressions which fail to designate an object, although their grammatical form seems to qualify them for that purpose, because the truth of some sentences is a prerequisite. Thus, it depends on the truth of the sentence, there was someone who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits, whether the subordinate clause, he who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits, really designates an object, or only seems to do so while having in fact no reference. And thus it might appear as if our subordinate clause contains a as a part of its sense, the, sort, the thought that there was somebody who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits. If this were right, the negation would run. Either he who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits did not die in misery, or there was some, nobody who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits. This arises from an incompleteness of language, from which even the symbolic language of mathematical analysis is not altogether free. Even their combinations of symbols can occur, which appear to refer to something having, at any rate so far, no reference, e.g. divergent infinite series. This can be avoided, e.g., by means of the special stipulation that divergent infinite series shall refer to the number O. A logically complete language, the Griff shift, should satisfy the conditions that every expression grammatically well constructed as a proper name out of signs already introduced shall in fact designate an object and that no new sign shall be introduced as a proper name without having referent assured. The logic books contain warnings against logical mistakes arising from the ambiguity of expressions. I regard as no less pertinent a warning against apparent proper names having no reference. The history of mathematics supplies errors which have arisen in this way. This lends itself to demagogic abuse as easily as ambiguity, perhaps more easily. The will of the people can serve as an example, for it is easy to establish that there is at any rate no generally accepted referent for this expression. It is by, therefore by no means unimportant to eliminate the source of these mistakes, at least in science, once and for all. Then such, such objections as the one discussed above would become impossible, because it could never depend upon the truth of a thought whether a proper name had a referent. With the consideration of these noun clauses, may be coupled the odd types of objective and adverbial causes which are logically closely related to them. Adjective clauses also serve to construct compound proper names, even if, unlike noun clauses, they are not sufficient by themselves for this purpose. These adjective clauses are to be regarded as equivalent to adjectives. Instead of the square root of 4 which is smaller than O, one can also say the negative square root of 4. We have here the case of compound proper name constructed from the predicate expression with the help of singular definite articles. This is at any rate permissible if the predicate applies to one and only one single object. Footnote. In accordance with what was said above, an expression of the kind in question must all actually always be assured of a referent by means of a special stipulation, e.g. Mm. by the convention that zero shall count it as its referent, when the predicate applies to no object or to more than one. Predicate expressions can be so constructed that characteristics are given by adjective clauses as in ex our example by the clause which is smaller than O. It is Footnote. In accordance with what was said above, an expression of the kind in question must all actually always be assured of a referent by means of a special stipulation, e.g. Mm. by the convention that zero shall count it as its referent, when the predicate applies to no object or to more than one. ...be lightly suggested or be expressed. Let the question be considered whether our sentence be false if Napoleon's decision has had already been made before he recognised the danger. If our sentence could be true in spite of this, the subsidiary thought should not be understood as part of the sense. One would probably decide in favour of this. The alternative would make for a quite complicated situation. We would have more simple thoughts and clauses. If the sentence, Napoleon realised the danger to his right flank, were now to be replaced by another having the same truth value, e.g. Napoleon was already more than 45 years old. Not only would our first thought be changed, but also our third one. Hence the truth value of the latter might change, namely if his age was not the reason for the decision to lead the guards against the enemy. This shows why clauses of equal truth value cannot always be substituted for one another in such cases. The clause expresses more through its connection with another than it does in isolation. Let us now consider cases where this regularly happens. In the sentence, 
Abel mistakenly supposes that the return of Alsace Lorraine would appease France's desire for revenge, two thoughts are expressed, which are not, however, shown by means of antecedent and consequent changes, causes. This, Babel believes that the return of Alsace Lorraine would appease France's desire for revenge. The return of Alsace Lorraine would not appease France's desire for revenge. In the expression of the first thought, the words of the subordinate clause have their indirect reference, while the same words have their customary reference in the expression of the second thought. This shows that the subordinate clause in our original complex sentence is to be taken twice over, with different reference of which one is a thought, the other a truth value. Since the truth value is not the whole referent of the subordinate clause, we cannot simply replace the latter by another of equal truth value. Similar considerations apply to expressions such as no, discover, it is known not. By means of a subordinate clause of reason and the associated main clause, we express several thoughts, which, however, do not correspond separately to the original clauses. In the sentence, because ice is less dense than water, it floats in water, we have one, ice is less dense than water, two, if anything is less dense than water, it floats in water, three, ice floats on water. The third thought, however, need not be explicitly introduced, since it is contained in the remaining two. On the other hand, neither the first and third nor the second and third combined would furnish the sense of our sentence. It can now be seen that our subordinate clause, because ice is less dense than water, expresses our first thought, as well as part of our second. This is how it comes to pass that our subsidiary clause cannot be simply replaced by another of equal truth value, for this would alter our second thought and thereby easily alter its truth value. The situation is similar in the sentence, if iron was less dense than water, it would float on water. Here we have the two thoughts that iron is not less dense than water, and that something floats on water if it is less dense than water. The subsidiary clause again expresses one thought in the part of the other. If we interpret the sentence already considered, after Schleswig-Holstein was separated from Denmark, Prussia and Austria quarrelled, in such a way that it expresses the thought that Schleswig-Holstein was once separated from Denmark, we have first this thought, and secondly the thought that, at a time more closely determined by the subordinate clause, Prussia and Austria quarrelled. Here also the subordinate clause expresses not only one thought, but also a part of another. Therefore, it may not in general be replaced by another of the same truth value. It is hard to exhaust all the possibilities given by language, but I hope to have brought to light at least the essential reasons why a subordinate clause may not always be replaced by another of equal truth value without harm to the truth of the whole sentence structure. These reasons arise. 1. When the subordinate clause does not refer to a truth value, inasmuch as it expresses only a part of the thought. 2. When the subordinate clause does refer to a truth value, but is not restricted to so doing, inasmuch as its sense includes one thought and part of another. The first case arises, A is an indirect reference of words, B if a part of the sentence is only an, in an indicator instead of the proper name. In the second case, the subsidiary clause may have to be taken twice over, namely once in its customary reference, and the other time in direct reference, or the sense of a part of the subordinate clause may likewise be a component of another thought, which taken together with the thought take directly expressed by the subordinate clause, makes up the whole sense of the whole structure sentence. It follows with sufficient probability from the foregoing that the cases where a subordinate clause is not replaceable by another of the same value cannot be brought in disproof of our view that its truth value is the referent of a sentence having a thought of its sense. Let us return to our starting point. If we found a equals a and a equals b to have different cognitive values, the the explanation is that for the purpose of knowledge, the sense of the sentence, namely the thought expressed by it, is no less relevant than its referent, i.e. its truth value. If now A equals B, then indeed the referent of B is the same as that of A, and hence the truth value of A equals B is the same as that of A equals A. In spite of this, the sense of B may differ from that of A, and thereby the sense expressed in A equals B differs from that of A equals A. In that case, the two sentences do not have the same cognitive value. If we understand by judgment the advance from the thought to its truth value, as in the above paper, we can also say that the judgments are different.